I just want to go ahead and introduce myself. It is one o'clock and we have so much fun stuff to do. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Deanne Stevens and I am a history professor at the University of Southern Mississippi, but I also do much, much, much in oral history. So University of Southern Mississippi has a premier, and I will use that word, a premier oral history collection. And we have the Center for the Study of Oral History and Cultural Heritage. So USM has been involved really in oral history since the 1970s. And I came on at USM in 19, about 2000, 1999, 2000. And since that time, I have been very much involved with it. So even though I teach academic history classes, I do oral history on the side. So when I was asked to do this, I was thrilled because oral history is one of those histories, and we're going to get into the history of oral history, but it's one of those things that really can open up for a community a record that heretofore was unknown. You just had no idea that this was going on and that these folks were involved and this was the result. So it really is a very different way of looking at history. So we'll go ahead and get into it and I'm so glad to see such a full house and I'm glad to see some folks I know. So I very am pleased with that and I have a booklet for you you know, we historians, we have to have everything written down. So let's go ahead and take one of these and pass it around and we'll go ahead and get started. Does anybody have any questions or anything? How about if I do that side and I can do this side? Okay. There we go. Yes, ma'am. I would say that oral history is now part of the academic uh, environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hate to see it separated into something that I mean, a lot of non-academics do, but a lot of academics use it for their research. But well, we're going to talk about that because it is an academic yeah. pursuit. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I sound, okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not a funzy thing that we go out and do and want to listen to stories. There's a whole lot more to it than that, even though we get to listen to great stories. Primary yeah. Right. It absolutely is an academic field. Everybody get a booklet. Okay, so let's go ahead and address this question about oral history. And we're not going to go over our booklets word for word. You all can look at it. But if you notice on the back of each page, I did leave it blank on purpose. I usually try to do back to back. But I thought maybe if you wanted to take notes, you could take notes in here and do what you want to do. But just to kind of get us on the same page as my students say about oral history. Oral history began um, in the 1940s. So there was a very large historical movement. Some of you might remember history books. And in the 1960s, there was a huge shift in history. But oral history predates that shift. So what's that shift I'm talking about in the 1960s? With the civil rights movements and all of the activities of the 1960s, history really sat back and decided that it should be, we historians, it should be from the bottom up. History had always been written from the top echelon. It was a very myopic viewpoint of history. It was white, socioeconomic, and it looked down and it said this is the way it was. So the big sweeping histories that once were written, that was the viewpoint. And people's voices who were down living in the towns and working in the factories, those voices simply were lost. They weren't there, they weren't considered. So in the 1960s, with all of the protest movements and things that were going on, it was decided, well, if women are out marching, maybe we should pay attention to women's history. If Native Americans are demanding things, maybe we should pay attention to the indigenous populations of the states. 
if African Americans are demanding change. Maybe we should start looking at these histories. So history, I like to think it's like an onion. You began peeling back this onion and every time you looked at a different voice in history, you learned something more about our nation. Deeper understanding of where we've been. But oral history predates that. Oral history began after World War II. And with World War II and the cataclysmic things that occurred in World War II, it was decided by one historian, a guy by the name of Alan Nevins, who is, if you're a historian, he's like the, one of the big ones. But Alan Nevins decided to do something very different and talk to some people. But he still was in the, time, the, the mind frame that who do you talk to? Well, you talk to big, important people. So the first oral histories were looking and talking with only what we might call the elite, the movers and shakers of a town, the movers and shakers of a government, not regular folks who lived within the town. So that part of oral history went on for a very good number of years. And it really didn't change until the 1960s when there was the opening of so many voices now contributing to the history of the nation. So that's when it changed. So early oral historians had a very different viewpoint about why they were collecting oral history. They were collecting it to get a one-sided view of history. And people of color and gender was not a consideration in the first oral histories. It was not until the 1960s that a whole new generation comes along of historians. And by this time, from that first oral history moving through, Columbia University in New York was one of the first to consider that this was a legitimate study in history. This is just like going to a book, opening up a book and reading about something. Well, you're literally going to a living book. You are talking to someone who has been through it, who has formed an opinion, who might have contributed to it, but again has seen the event and probably the result. So oral history, in history we talk about each generation having a different way of looking at history. Oral history is the same thing. So oral history in today's world has finally reached where you and I are today. And that is coming up with an idea in a community, answering questions in that community, and seeking people who can answer those questions. That's as simple as it is. And do you have to be a historian to perform and do and have fun with oral history? No. But do you have to have a plan and do you have to understand what you're doing and the ultimate goal of what you're doing? Absolutely yes. Otherwise, it's going to be chaotic and the results of the oral history project will not yield what you and your organization wanted it to yield. So there are some things to take into account and it goes back to the question about oral history being a legitimate study. Absolutely it is. And there is an oral history association which we're going to look at in our booklet and talk about what they do. There's conferences for oral history. You can go to school and get an emphasis in oral history. USM, which is of course the school closest to us and the one I am most fam excuse me, familiar with. You know, we have a, um, oh y'all, they're calling them badges and certificates now. A student can go through, get a history degree, but take, you know, 12 extra hours of classes, and they then get an oral history badge or certificate, which means then that they are recognized that they can be, you know, leading these kinds of things and performing oral history projects. So oral history is from Michigan, 
all the way down from New York all the way over to California. Universities are embracing oral history right now. And it goes along so well with the digital activities that are going on now in libraries. And I know that Dr. Holmes back there could talk to us more about that as the librarian, but it goes hand in hand in collecting these things. So it is a great process. And I've been told, I know of a oral history project that has finished in Bay St. Louis, but I also was told when I was asked to do this that there are other projects going on in Bay St. Louis. So who is involved or in the planning stages or actually going out collecting oral histories right now? What are we doing, sir? We're interviewing a lot of um, our older people that's in the 80s and 90s. And they, they can even be a little younger than that. Just So we're, we're interviewing those people. And what I did is I went on the internet and pulled up a bunch of questions because I wasn't quite sure mm -hmm. what was the proper questions to ask. Um, and who is this for? This is all for the descendants of Juan de Cueva's family. Okay. Okay, so there's an association that's overseeing that. Did you receive any type of outside funding for this? No, we did not. Okay, I can help with that. Okay. Yeah, so one of the things to realize, and thank you for sharing that, one of the things to be aware of is that if you are looking to do an oral history project, now perhaps your particular organization has funds that can support that. And we're gonna talk about what I mean later about what is it that you support. And don't you just kind of go out and listen to people? No, <laughs> there's a little more to it than that. So, you know, what? where are these monies gonna go? And there is a specific source of money and other suggestions that I can make. So even when you think about getting down to looking at your project, so, you know, coming up with the project, what organization is going to support the project? Always good to be a 501c3. Always good if you can do it that way. And then how are you going to be doing that project? And then we're going to talk about once the project is done, what are you going to do with it? Where's it going to be? How are you going to house it? And lots of times funding depends upon how are you going to house it and where are you going to put it? You know, you can't go home to your living room. There has to be something that you're doing with the oral history project. Because remember, uppermost, you are collecting history. You are collecting something that has never been known before because that person lived and walked the history. That's as simple as that. It's like when you used to sit down and you listen to your grandmother or you listen to your mother talk about when she was a little girl and what she used to do. And I know I think if only I would have recorded my mother. I've lost that. So you can have in-house oral history projects that are for you and your family and your genealogy but if you are part of an organization and that organization wants to get a hold of that history family or of an organization, then that is something we're going to talk about today. Okay? So we just went over the first couple, two or three pages in your booklet. It's as simple as that. Um, <clears throat> let's think about, with looking at our booklets, we can get on into it. I went ahead and gave the history where Columbia University, that's on page one. We know oral histories have always been part of society. Um, that is storytelling is whether you sat around the kitchen table and listened to your relatives talk about stories or whether we go back and look at indigenous populations who did not have the written word. That storytelling has always been. And really it was not until the, and that's on page two, it's not till the Sumerians came up with the written word that and that would have been 35, 3400 BC, 
that, you know, prior to that, everything was an oral tradition. And there still are societies today that have oral traditions. We know this. So the, the spoken word has been the first recorded history, and that is where we are looking at. I introduced a book to you on page three in the second paragraph. And this is a book that if you are still questioning or you want to read further about oral history, this is a good one. It kind of, uh, Kant's just sort of lays it all out there for us. And it's the course, the oral history and local historian. Well, that's what y'all are gonna become. You're going to become local historians when you embark on an oral history project. You will be the keepers of the oral tradition. And this is a very important. And I did want to look at that paragraph where we first mentioned him and maybe because, and it's right there, Kant asserts that oral history is a means of exploring local history and that it is not just reminiscing and descripting, but it is capable of deepening and widening an analytical understanding of the world of the past. That's exactly what you're going to do. That's exactly what you're going to do. And when I put the booklet together, I put it together to move towards what your projects might be. I'm assuming the projects that you are thinking about doing are not going to go over into Biloxi. They're probably not going to head up to Hattiesburg. My assumption is, and don't let me assume wrongly, my assumption is that you want to keep it local and you want to keep it at home to make sure that that slice of Hancock County or Bay St. Louis history is preserved because with each passing person, there goes a whole history book. It's as simple as that. So, you know, it's not a frantic quest, but it is a quest that the sooner we can get started, I always feel like the best it is, okay? So there are things that we need to think about when we're doing oral histories. So I would like to hear, is anyone else besides this gentleman thinking of a project? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I'm with the Wayland's Ground Zero Museum. Oh, yeah. And so we did an oral history with um, DMR, with the Heritage Grant, and we did an oral history of survivors. Okay? Mm -hmm. But what we want to do now is the building that we're housed in is a historic building, and it was the Wayland School in 1929 and on. So we want to do an oral history of residents who actually went to that school. That's outstanding. And you've got a lady sitting right next to you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> How well I know. Yes. <laughs> Miss <things> <laughs> Thompson, um, uh, raise your hand. Miss <laughs> Thompson and the friends of Valina C. Jones School just finished an oral history project. Yep. And that's exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what they did, and I'm very familiar with your museum. I was the director of the Katrina Research Center that worked with you years ago. Yes, yeah, so it, it's a great museum and it's a great project. But when we think about whether we're talking about Valina or we're talking about this school, look, ladies and gentlemen, how narrowly focused that becomes. When my students come to me and say, and we're in the midst of grading, finals were last week, it's crazy at USM right now, and they, they come to me and they'll say something to me, you have, they all have to do research papers. You remember that. You got to do a research paper. That's history. And they'll come and they'll say, I, I think I want to do a research paper on the Roman Empire. Oh. <laughs> and you just... You can't break their little hearts, <laughs> but you have to say, well, have you thought about, and you have to finally get them down, you know, down, 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 down to something that they can handle. This is another thing that we're going to talk about. What is it that you wish to accomplish? And it's going to have to be a very narrow focus. 
oral history, history in itself in writing is a very slow process. We're very patient people. And it's just, if you, for example, you do research, you might research a book for six, 10 years, and it's going to take about another four or five to finally get it published. So that's been that segment. Oral history, the easiest part is getting the oral histories. That's the easiest part. And then there's a lot that goes on after that. So we'll talk about that. But there are certain things when you are doing oral history, and I'm just kind of moving through the booklet, but when you, and it is the same thing as researching, when you are entrusted to hear someone's story, and that really is such a responsibility, you are going to probably go to someone's home. Your 80 and 90 year olds, do you go to them or do they come to you? We go to them. That's exactly correct. Folks are comfortable in their homes. They don't quite understand what's going on sometimes. You come in with your little machine. Oral history is not video. It's all auditory. If you want to do video, that will be up to your group. And that's even more intimidating for folks. So, you know, you have to be very unobtrusive when you go in. You have to be very accommodating when you come in. And then when you go into someone's home, they've invited you into their home, and they're going to sit there about an hour, hour and 10 minutes and tell you life stories. That is probably, to me, one of the greatest trusting relationships that you can have. I can go to a book in a library and I can research with no problem and I'm all by myself and that's it. But when I go in front of someone and I'm listening to them. So oral history, I always like to think of it as a very honorable pursuit of history. Extremely honorable pursuit of history. And there are, there's paperwork and there's trust involved. And if we look at the middle of the page, on page three, there's also some responsibilities involved for the oral history process. Um, you will be an interviewer. So the little term, you are the interviewer. And the people whom you are talking to, sometimes they are called the interviewee, and sometimes they are called the narrator. So why would we call people whom we are speaking to, why would we call them a narrator? Because they're narrating their story. They're narrating their story. Mm -hmm. They are the narrators of their story. So you'll see the words used interchangeably. It's no which one is correct and which one isn't. It just depends upon which one you and your organization are comfortable with and which one you decide to use if you try to get a grant to do the oral history. Just be consistent. Once you decide it, just be consistent. So the responsibility to the interviewees slash narrators. So they should absolutely know, number one, what is going on. So once a decision is made by an organization that an oral history project is going to ensue, then there has to be what's the purpose of it. And again, if we're interviewing those who graduated from schools, I think the purpose there is pretty clear. We want to capture with those narrators what the teachers were like, what the curriculum was like, what lunch was like, what we went to school, and how did we feel about going to that school. But who has any other thoughts about an oral history project other than schools? Anybody else thinking of a project, sir? Yeah, I'm developing a, a, a project to uh, interview those who were displaced by Positive way, um, and there's a lot of them that passed away, a lot of children.
who were displaced and moved in those uh, locales. So that's, what, that's what we're focused on. We're having a I'm sponsoring a reunion on November, I think it's second, um, out in Burlington with that. We're just working on got a professional videographer, but they aren't cheap. So it's time to figure it out. Videographers, it's an expense, yeah. So is there an organization, sir, that's doing this? We went to apply for a grant um, through the state, so the, we've gotten, uh, we've been meeting with the uh, Historical Society, Hancock County Historical Society, and they've agreed to apply for the grant. But when I got the grant application, it was, it was bizarre. That's all I can say. It was, it was really bizarre. Uh -huh. The things they wanted, it didn't, it didn't fit like what we're doing. So we're going to be looking at corporate sponsors, and I'm still interested in applying for some grants, too. So, okay. Uh, and Dr. Kiri Kudis, do you remember him? I know him well. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. He's, he's helping me on some things, trying to do some stuff. Okay. So Name of an organization. Yeah, There's we're just. In Burlington and, um, we're losing friends and people who experience this, and I think we need to establish it and, you know, and keep it. And I want to keep it in the reservoir here and at the oral history department. USA yeah. Um, it's a great grant idea. Um, I think when you speak with Dr. Kirkutis, he's going to probably recommend that you become the. A name of something so that you can put it down if you want to apply for grants. Um, let, yeah. If the Historical Society can do it, you've already got a 501c3 tax exempt organization. And Graham, if they don't, at the Ground Zero Museum's 501c3, we, could, we would be willing to do that as well. There you go. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. Because we want to do more about the county, too. You know, and, and yeah. That Curlington um, lecture was riveting, so I would love to do that. Yeah, so this is a good, this is also good for networking here with this. Ma'am? Yes, um, I'm Dr. Jan Benita White. I'm a I'm just still in the brainstorming mood, mode, but um, I've already conducted a couple of uh, phenomenology projects. And what, it, what is, what is oral, oral history. <laughs> and um, I did this with the help of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. They were very helpful to me. And I had to identify gaps before I could conduct the research. This was under the umbrella of a university. So I found a couple of gaps. Number one, older women have been left out of the research because yep. they were interviewing important people and veterans. So there's, there was a huge gap in homemakers, older homemakers. And I've always wondered, what was their day like? What, what were they doing? How did they spend their time? How, you know, I wanted to know the who, what, where, when, how of everything they did with their life. You are a social historian. Mm -hmm. Well, thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> So I've always had this in the back of my mind, and now that I'm involved with the um, Senior Center in Diamond Head, I think this would be a great place to start documenting this. I want to know about ordinary people, and by the way, there are great resources at the Library of Congress. I spent a lot of months there in the basement. They work with me, and they are uniquely interested in documenting dialects <coughs> or losing dialects because people are becoming homogenized. They want those in their repository. So anyway, I'm just kind of brainstorming, and any ideas you can give me, I would appreciate. And that would be a very good project. That would be a very good project. And again, if the senior citizen, if the senior organization in Diamond Head, if you could just come up with some group uh, and again, I'm sure that there are groups here that I don't want to say would take it in, but there would be. Uh, Hancock County Historical, I think, would be very interested in that. Yeah. We we want the history. Of, oh, you are. I'm sorry, I'm Beverly Freeman. No, no, it's a the historic society. Treasurer, whatever. Um, <laughs> board members. Um, we have a form where we want every person who living or 
for somebody who has deceased, if somebody will fill out a page, uh, life story, uh, highlight, obviously, and um, a small picture. <coughs> and, you know, we file those away. We're, we're, we're hoping to be able to document as many people as we can. <coughs> so you want a census rather than an oral history? Uh, yes. However, if you're familiar with this, if you've seen our newsletter, every month um, Dr. Jim Keating usually, although others submit articles too, has an article on um, Hancock County and usually focuses on an individual or individual families or whatever. Um, and he's always hungry, hungry, hungry for stories. So he happily goes and interviews whoever uh, is willing to be interviewed for an article. So perhaps I'm, yeah, I'm hearing a good partnership here that if this is what you are doing, then you have the interviewees that you are collecting, the, the women whom you have mentioned, that this gentleman who you have mentioned mm -hmm. perhaps can get with this group mm -hmm. and there can be then an oral history collection for that group. Mm -hmm. And then this gentleman, and I'm just, I'm sorry I'm talking in third persons here because I don't know the, but that person who is doing this then can begin collecting these and putting people together, families together, mm -hmm. occupations together, where they went to school together. Mm -hmm. And then you can have ongoing oral history projects of those particular people whom you have those records for. Mm -hmm. And then you have a much more rich history rather than just the picture and the things that were written down, you actually have what did those people do in their life? What did they cook for dinner on Sunday? You know, you've got this that's going on. Right. So that would be a very good marriage in this. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult not to have an umbrella under which to work. It, it's just extremely difficult to try to, and the ideas are just so great and there's so much because everybody has a story. Everybody. It's just what story do you want for your project? And you simply cannot go in, and we're still on number one on our list here, but you just simply cannot go in and look at someone and say, tell me about yourself, and put the <laughs> recorder down. That's like I want to do a paper on the Roman Empire. You know, you have to have a project, a specific time frame, and in reality, you've been doing interviews, sir. Ms. Thompson has done interviews. How long are you able to interview an 80 or 90 year old person? How many minutes? We've had where we stretched it, and we've had it like maybe an hour, but then we knock it down whenever we go in and edit the video. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're and doing video too? Yeah. Well, okay. That, that's our main thing is that we oh, do the video. Oh, okay. So once we get in there and start editing, of course, it'll go down to probably 35, 40 minutes. Right. Because not many people you're going to catch on YouTube sitting on and watch a video, you know, something like right. that for an hour. Right. So you got to knock the time down. Right. How long were you able to interview Ms. Thompson? Well, I went in with a goal of 30 to 45 minutes, but I felt I had to re I develop that relationship first and allow them to talk, so typically it went an hour and a half. Right. Yeah. You're not going to be able to do an oral history interview much more than that. It's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting if you have done your job well as an interviewer. And so when we think about number one, the purposes and procedures, what is the goal of the project? The person should know everything about the project. We are interviewing you because, and if that is a written email, and again, keep in mind, 
Some people were interviewing. The communication is difficult at best. Telephone, maybe going by the house. Well, I don't check my email every day. I, don't, I forgot my password. You know, how you're going to get with someone oftentimes too is difficult once you've identified who it is you want to, who, who do you want to interview? And that is a lot of prep work. It's like painting a house. The prep work is more than the house painting job. You've got to get the prep work done. And one of the most is thinking about how you're going to get people at the table and come up with the procedures and what the purpose of the project is. So we're looking at oral history here, which very well would fit your project very well. You could do both at one time. And that is another thing. Who's helping you? You know, we all have great ideas, but what organization is helping you and who's going to do what? Then, once you get that taken care of, you can reach out and go ahead then and begin the project by getting in touch with the people and tell them what it is you're doing. But you absolutely have to have that step first. You owe it to the people. And you don't want to call them the morning of and say, now I'm coming at 2. Remember, we made that appointment. <laughs> they need time. One of the things that I have found, and maybe some of you also, and it's not always the case, it's intimidating. When you are asking someone to sit there and you say, okay, we're going to talk about when you went to school in the sixth grade. We're looking at someone who's maybe 82 years old. And what, well, what do you want to know? You know, I, I can't remember. You need to let people have time to think about it. And the procedures then is, I'm going to come into your house. We want to make you comfortable. If you want a few questions ahead of time, I can provide those. And we'll just sit there and we'll just have a conversation. I can tell you one time I went out, it was up in Latimer. It was an elderly gentleman. I was doing an oral history for Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. I think he was testing me. He said, get on the back of this tractor and we'll go out to the field and then I'll talk to you. <laughs> Off I went. Back and had a piece of coconut cake and it was a great interview. <laughs> so you don't know what you're going to encounter when you go for an oral history interview. Also, if you are interviewing older people, oftentimes, and I've had it many a time, children will be there. Grown children want to make sure mom is okay and who is this and what do they want to know. So you, you just simply don't know. Everything has to be, and again, that is that, that's integrity that we have as interviewers that we set this up and we make sure it's going to be successful. We don't ever want someone to be intimidated to the point you know, of this. So the procedure knowledge ahead of time to the person who you're going to interview is extremely important. Very, very important. And that is something that we will talk about. Number two, so we're looking at page three, number two. Who came in and did not get a booklet? Yeah, I think we've got, we're good. Okay, okay, good, y'all are sharing. Thank you. So interviewees should sign a legal release. If you look to the back of the, the very back, there's two forms that I shared with you that USM uses. This isn't necessarily the form you're going to use, but let's talk about this. It says, the Center for Oral History and Cultural Heritage, gift of personal statement, it looks like this. You should have somebody, and I'm sure in these organizations that there is someone whom you know, 
for you. You cannot use this one, but you can use the spirit of this one. You may use this form and it will be given to you through the Center for Cultural Heritage and Oral History if you do funding through the Mississippi Humanities Council. So let me just explain how that works. If you wish to apply for monies through the Mississippi Humanities Council, which I highly encourage everybody to do with an organization. Individuals are not able to. It has to be an organization. So I've probably talked about get an organization behind you. Get an umbrella under which you can stand, okay? So once you do that, then if you want to apply for the Humanities Council, I'll tell you where all of this money comes from with the Mississippi Humanities Council. Back in 1999, when the nation was getting ready to celebrate its bicentennial, Barbara Carpenter, Dr. Barbara Carpenter, she lives in Louisiana now, was the director of the Mississippi Humanities Council. And she had a vision that the Mississippi legislature could support the collection of oral history. Now, Dr. Carpenter was an English professor. So any academic field can come in on this. It's not restricted. Please don't get that idea that it's restricted to historians. It can be anybody. So with her advocacy and lots and lots of work and background work, the Mississippi legislature in 1999 appropriated a quarter of a million dollars for six pilot oral history programs. And I am proud to say I was one of them. There were six programs around the state. It was a experiment to see how it went, that if this was successful, then the legislature and the Humanities Council, so the State Humanities Council gets monies from the National Humanities Council. There's a lot of trickle flow money that comes in, and this could have been very good. And it turned out that it was very good. There are hundreds of oral histories now that have been done. Everything from church women groups all the way up to university departments. It doesn't matter. There was recently a group on the coast, um, an oral history project recently that I finished up with, and it was looking at the history of transportation, and it went through CTA, the Coast Transit Authority. Who would have thought? So it can go wherever you want it to go, folks. It can really do that. So the Humanities Council has monies earmarked from 2000 every year specifically for oral history grants. And you can avail yourself of those through a grant process. The oral history grants, there are, um, it's not a difficult thing to do. It takes humanity scholars, it takes a budget, it takes a reason why and a how you're gonna do it. Very logical things that we are talking about. But here is the difference with working with the Mississippi Humanities Council. The Mississippi Humanities Council is tied to the University of Southern Mississippi Center for the Cultural Heritage and Oral History. They work hand in hand because USM had the only center at the time. That center dates back to the 1970s. And it really is world class. You can go on USM's oral history you can listen to Fannie Lou Hamer talking about what she did back in the 1960s. You hear her voice. Mm -hmm. So somebody was very visionary at USM back in the 1970s. So when you get a grant from, US, from the Mississippi Humanities Council, you automatically get the help of USM. You automatically get that help. And you automatically get the legal documents that have gone through the lawyer, and everything at USM. This is a binding legal document. And you cannot turn the, com the recorder on unless someone has signed this document. 
if you have a Humanities Council grant. Because this gives, this legal document, this gift statement, gives the world the narrator's story to go into the record of history. And if the narrator is not going to give permission for you to do that, well, I mean, lawsuits, all kinds of things can happen. Yes, ma'am. IRBs are coming into vogue in some right now. We don't have it at USM. If you're not familiar with what this is about, is if you're working with people, there's an institution of research that you have to go through to make sure you can work with people. So USM right now, oral history is not under that. But that doesn't mean that's not with other universities and other entities. It is becoming part and parcel with oral history interviews because protecting everybody, of course, of course. Yes, ma'am. Does the, um, when you work with USM, do they do all the transcription as well? Well, right? now there is something to talk about. We're ahead of our conversation, but there is something to talk about. It's a big expense. It is a huge expense. Yeah. And I'm so impressed that you all have edited things already. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, has anybody else been involved in transcriptions? Okay, how long do they take? It's labor too long. intensive. I had to hire a service to help me. Yeah, there are some. Yeah. Well, now there's AI. And there's well, AI. we don't want to go to AI. <laughs> yes. I did qualitative research, I have done some yeah. stuff. And, and there's software that facilitates that, but it, it still, still is very, is very. Well. Fun yeah, if you have someone, I had an intern last summer that was um, doing transcriptions for me. She was working on her Master's of Library Science at USM. So her whole internship was sitting there listening. And, you know, in the old days, you could count on an hour and a half to two hours per page. But when you look at transcriptions, and we're going to look at one that I have included in the booklet from and 40s, excuse me, um, every um, every cough, <coughs> the actual transcription will <laughs> spell that out. I mean, they try to put everything into the transcription, and it is extremely tedious and time-consuming. USM is so far behind on transcriptions, so far behind. The problem, though, is if you go with a Humanities Council grant, you are wedded, um, and the, the oral histories will go to USM and become part. That doesn't mean you don't have your copies, but it becomes part because you're working with the Humanities Council where you're telling the story of Mississippi since the year 2000. That was the whole purpose and why the legislature is using our tax money to do that. So it's adding to the greater story of the development of Mississippi. So you your oral histories go up there, it becomes part of the story. Ultimately, it is transcribed. Ultimately, it's bound. Ultimately, it finds its way on the web. And then you're part of the world. Okay, I saw a hand back here. Yes, ma'am. So when you partner with, when you get the Humanities Council grant, you partner with USM, your recordings get hosted on USM's oral history website? Yep. So you can ultimately. ultimately. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, ultimately. And ultimately, now, there's a little more to that with the gift of statement. So other questions or comments before that? Yes, ma'am. So if you are wedded to them can, and you do something like an online exhibit, let's say with a, like Omika with one of those services, can you do your own thing in addition Absolutely. To that? So you don't, you're not like exclusive, you can tie into other? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Time about if, say, cassette tape was sent, tapes, maybe six. Year and a half to two. That would be how long it would take? Probably. Okay. For so it to be to bound, backwards. for it to be bound, and for it to come out. Yes. Yeah. But there's a little more. Okay. So, okay. That's Let's. Okay. I'm putting a pin in it, but I want to talk no, about no, no. it later. No, no, no. 
I like that pin. Okay. And please, don't be afraid to pin. <laughs> but when you have the oral history done, okay, so we're, we're still on page three, but we're moving through. You send the oral history up to USM. There is the Center for the Study of Cultural Heritage. The oral history then is accepted. They absolutely will not accept it without a gift statement. Felina C. Jones, may I? A couple of gift statements were missing. Oh. I had to go right back and say, where are they? I got to have gift statements. There's no way that these will be accepted without gift statements because USM isn't going to put itself or the Humanities Council in the way without having a legal document from the person who was interviewed. You have to have that. Whether you're with USM or not, I wouldn't even begin an oral history project if I did not have some kind of a statement made up. And it could be, it doesn't even have to look like this. Whatever you want. Whatever the organization wants. But here's the scenario moving on with that to answer these questions. Once that is done, then once it is completely turned into USM, then the director of the grant can go and say to the Humanities Council, we're done. Everything has been turned in. Then the monies can come reimburse and that money's then and you are good with the Mississippi Humanities Council for the money. Receipts went in, everything is in, you are good with USM. The grant for you is finished. For Ms. Thompson, that grant and Mr. Harris back there, that grant is finished. So it now is in USM's hands. And USM then gets monies and they have student transcribers, they store them, they put them, the transcription ultimately is bound. But here is the middle part that I haven't mentioned yet. So, and it kind of goes to number two and three that we're, I mean one and two that we're still talking about. We have to respect the people so much whom we interview. And what if we do an interview and we're sitting there and the person is talking and going on and it's a great interview and you think this is great, you turn it in, everything is done and it's transcribed. With USM, the transcription goes back to the person. Now, if unfortunately this has happened, if that person has passed away between that time, it goes to a family member. They read through that interview Oh my God, I didn't want to say that. Oh, wow. So you take the magic black pen whoosh, 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 and you get to rub it out. And it never becomes the record. Because remember, this is the record that is going to get on the internet. This is the record of a historical record. And once it gets put out, folks, it never goes away. Sir? They have to be given an opportunity if it's just transcribed or if it's if for the oral, just the oral the trans Description is the only thing that they see. They don't rehear the interview. Right. So I, I kind of skipped ahead a little bit. I'm sorry, but no problem. We're, we're getting there early, but as I understand it, preferred uh, business practice is to allow them to hear the. If I do the 45-minute video, say I'll let you watch the video. You come in there if there's something in there you don't want to include or whatever, we can edit it or not. But do you have to allow them to do that? It depends upon your group, and it's a video. If your group decides that you want the person whom you interviewed to listen to their interview, you may do that, not a problem, before you even send it up to USM. You may, that is not a problem. The video is different. The question is you don't have to though. No, because with this grant, if you read it, I mean, and with this, ultimately they are gonna see their words in writing. And before it becomes public knowledge, before it becomes the property of the university, before it becomes a property of anybody, they have the right to go through and edit it out and read. They can't, I mean, if they don't like the interview, they can say, no, I don't like the interview, you can't have it. And they can cancel the 
whole, they can cancel the whole thing. That's the tough part if you're like partially private the funding relative. a videographer to come in there for That's the tough oh, part. Like, I've had people in the middle of an interview just kind of, no, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. Hmm. Click off. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. That's the end of it. This is not something that, and I think we all know this, you, you can't force people to do this. And when you ask people, setting up who it is you're going to interview, you might get more no's than you get yeses. You absolutely might. No, I don't want to do that. You know, what, I don't have, the really sad thing to me is, I don't have anything to say. That's one of the saddest things I have to hear. I don't, I don't know what to say. But sometimes people are intimidated by this. But when someone says enough is enough, you turn off the recorder and you're done. And at the end of the day, there are people then, there is a way, once you sign a gift statement, if you go back, you as the person who was interviewed can send an email or send a note and you can say, you can do the transcription, but I don't ever want it seen. I want it to remain private. And we have had people say, I want it to remain private until I die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a legal choice they can make. So there's a lot of legality to doing oral history than we might not think of at first blush. Yes? Then if you have, if the has sent the tapes or the audio mm -hmm. to USM, to the oral history, but has not received the transcript. Well, USM does the transcript. Right. right. So they would send the transcript so it could go over to make sure everything is the way it you want, that you would be able to edit. Yes. So you send the audio to USM. Mm -hmm. USM gets ready, puts it in the queue, mm -hmm. gets the transcript ready. The transcript goes back mm -hmm. to the person who was interviewed. Mm -hmm. That person has, sometimes they forget about them. That person has lots of time to look it over and then ultimately send it back to USM. At that point, anything that has been marked out mm -hmm. is removed right. in the final transcript. Right. Then it is bound. And then it is put on the shelf, and you and I can go up there at any point. Oh, this is about lumbering. Pull it off and read John Smith's oral history about when he worked in the lumber camps. Okay. It becomes if, public knowledge. But if it never came back? It's gone. Huh? <laughs> well, well, no, please, I'm sorry. Yeah. If, if it was never transcribed, if it was never sent back to the person, to me, who sent it. It will be with USM. So then the tapes are there, but it, there is no transcript of it. I'm sorry, that's why I said, let me wait till this is finished and we can. Yeah, I'll let you and I chit chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. So um, I'm, think, I'm, I'm with Jan on the Diamond Head Senior Village, but I'm, I'm looking around here and there's a lot of members of St. Rose de Lima Catholic Church that is um, celebrating the centennial in a couple please, of years. Please, please. So I'm thinking that <laughs> oral history would be a really cool thing but I would imagine it needs and I think people would be willing to participate and we are a 501c3 but um, do we go through USM to get focused um, you know, you. but if no, but for guidance um, like focused uh, maybe focused questions or or uh, you know I don't want to yes no but to open up so that there's some continuity in, or some, a, a theme. I'm, so you do thematic analysis or something. Right. Um, so USM won't tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. USM no, couldn't, know. but they will say, they'll look at you, and they'll say, what is it that you want to do as this project? Do you want, um, let me tell you another project that I, I know of very well. Gulf Coast Carnival Association. Anybody in on it? All right. It's Gulf Coast Carnival Association. They wanted to know about all of the queens and kings for carnival. So what did they do? They went back and they knew that there were, this was years ago, 
They knew that there were some queens who were in the 1930s to the 1940s and the 1950s all the way up. So each decade got a different grant and they interviewed. You might want to look at some of the oldest citizens of the church. And this is the kind of suggestions USM is going to make. They're going to say, this has happened with similar organizations. Perhaps you want to have those church members from the earliest decades and look at them going up. And then it would be a very finite look. You would look at people from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and then move on. Well, if you don't want to do that, maybe you want to find or look at who has been the um, administrators, who's been the clergy. You can do that. So there's so many different ways you can split that and do it. And USM is not, they would never say, I think you should. They will offer suggestions and then help you with focus questions. And then once you figure it out, ladies and gentlemen, what it is, the path you want to go down, then you can begin thinking about questions that would be uniform questions throughout. But that can be a slippery slope too. That can be a slippery slope. Did I answer your question? You did. I, see, I'm, I'm thinking on our centennial though is like really the theme of our church is kind of building up the youth and um, like giving a message for the youth, for the future of the parish. And I'm wondering if we could do something on, you know, on that. Well, I would love to see, I would love to see all of you all get yeah, together at the end of the last hour of the seminars. We're going to get together in little pods and we're going to have fun. And I would love to see you all get together and think about what is it that you want to do with that church project. Because it again, really and truly keep the idea you can't do a research paper on the Roman Empire. You've got to get to very specific things to do. And it's a perfect example. Let me give you all a big hint. The Mississippi Humanities Council wants grants from the coast and from civic organizations. Because I can tell you right now, who puts grants in from the coast? USM. And they w want civic organizations to do it. If you do it now, maybe you would ask for six or seven thousand dollars, maybe you would get funded for five or six. Something's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. So it really is, these are all wonderful ideas and I am saying do it, do it, do it. Absolutely do it. Okay? So any other questions? Yes ma'am. Yes. So let's say you've done, the, you've had the interview, you've done the reporting, you've sent the tapes in, the transcript is done, it comes back, the person, the interviewee is reviewing it, and they say, I got more to say. Yeah. <laughs> then you can go back for a second interview. We've got that with Valina C. Jones. Okay. I wonder where does that, so. There we, is called a regrant. Okay. You, so, you yeah. can't, the thing is too with a grant, you have to be very, very careful. The grant is the legal contract with you and the Mississippi Humanities Council. You can't go off and do what you want to do. If the grant says, I'm going to spend $200 on a photographer, that's what you get to spend. Now, you can shift 10% from other lines, but 10% doesn't go well without getting permission from the Humanities Council. If the grant says we are going to try to do 10 oral histories, well, then if you don't quite make it, you don't quite make it, but one looks pitiful. So you want to try to get as close as you can. But that grant, particularly that financial obligation, is absolutely what you say is what you got. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you say is what you got. So you wouldn't go back and redo another interview with that same grant. 
what you would tell your interviewee slash narrator is we appreciate you've got so much to say we're going to re-grant which means we're going to try to go for another grant and honestly a re-grant with a successful grant phew, yeah. you're flying it's no problem it's yeah so what is an acceptable uh, or how do you determine how do you determine sample size? Do you, just you heard, well, you heard, it depends. Every, every grant is different. So we heard about a 35 minute video here, about a video, about talking for about an hour and a half here. I usually limit about an hour for because your interviewee is going to be exhausted and quite frankly so are you um, so you think about that and you also think about when you write the grant and remember folks you can write your grant however you want to write your grant however some grants pay interviewers some grants don't some grants give mileage maybe you have um, Okay, you're talking about your church. Well, maybe one of your members has moved to Houston. It's just, you've got to go to Houston to get this interview. The number of people that you get, like uh, in your grant, how many interviews? This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. You have to think about, are you gonna pay your interviewers, interview them, where do they live that you're gonna interview, and if you're traveling all over Hancock County and you're trying to set up people to come or you go there, you might not get five or six interviews. A grant cycle only lasts so long. You've got X amount of time to work with it. Normally a grant goes within nine months to a year. If you try to do it less than that, it creates a lot of issues. A lot of issues you want to try to go at least and if you go with public monies remember this is the Humanities Council is your money and my money you have to have a public program so a good number depending on where they are I would say a good number might be from 8 to 10 oral history grants maybe you'll get 12 good for you but you you it's just kind of impossible to try to get more um, the people who are doing the interviews, they're perhaps still working. Perhaps they, you know, you're having to share a tape recorder. Not everybody's going to have their own tape recorder. There, you know, there's so many variables in creating a successful grant. All I say and caution you is be realistic. Just absolutely be realistic with people. Yes. Um, I spoke with Miss Anderson this morning. She's the grant. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. And she said that, um, and in fact, it says on their website, send your drafts, right? Mm -hmm. She offered, she will. which is amazing. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. She, if you have an idea, send your proposal. This is, budget, she'll discuss it with the you. Humanities Council is almost begging for grants she from did. these she entities. Yeah. Yes. She, really so she works beautifully. And then just to follow up on that, just to follow up, so you have someone at USM, you have a group of students and you have Dr. Kevin Green, whose name is down here, who's the director. I would be happy to help you. You've got me sitting over in Long Beach, Biloxi. You've got Carol Anderson in Jackson, who is the director of the Humanities Council, who will answer any and all questions Assistant and help director. you. Assistant, Assistant director. director. You know, I mean, you can get all kinds of help on this grant. All kinds of help on this grant. But you really, I would begin thinking about when I left this room, if I were sitting here, I would get my group together and begin thinking about, I've got a deadline coming up, maybe what, September, something like that, look it up, don't hold September me to that, and then do it. I'm sorry, ma'am, what? No, I was just going to say, the oral history grants, mm -hmm. she said start about at 2000, and they're rotating, so yeah. just whenever. Just do them. The big one is September 15th. Yeah. yeah, do them. Yeah. Do them. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. And all that's online. It's, it's really very easy. It's just taking that first step and getting it started and understand what you're doing, that it takes a lot more planning and a lot more thought 
than maybe at first thought that needed to be done, okay? So, any questions on the gift statement? All right, got to have it. And she'll tell you the same thing. You've got to have the gift statement. So if we go back then to page three, under responsibilities to interviewees, you should use the best recording equipment possible. If you go with the Humanities Council, it will buy equipment. If you have equipment at your church and you're comfortable with it, that's good. If you have private equipment, that's good. But you don't want the equipment breaking down in the middle of something and you've got to say, oh wait, hold on, did I get that? And it, it, it's very disconcerting and it kind of upsets the flow. So this is kind of a, get your equipment good, okay? Yes, ma'am. If you said the humanities would, uh, would buy the equipment if you needed it. The grant buys the equipment. Not the, you know, yeah, right. the grant buys the equipment. And where would you find that? You would find that in your financial statement and you would put down four recorders. You would look up online the recorder you want, you would say how much it is, and then you would say four times that, and that's what you would ask the Humanities Council for in the grant. Yes, sir. Yes, what yes, are sir. The other acceptable uh, items that you can put down to request money for? You can re you said, you know, travel or right. You can have travel. You can pay honoraria. You can an honoraria would be for the interviewers. You can give them some money if you want. You can pay for rental of services. So if you had to rent a a hall for the public program to be in, you could pay for that. You cannot buy food with the grant. You cannot buy alcohol with the grant. Uh, but you can pay for postage. You can pay, if you wanted to buy one of the transcription programs, you could buy a transcription program. A laptop? No. No. Big, that's good, though. Big ticket items, no. Printing, they could do. Printing, they would do. Recorders, they would do. You know? depends on what you want and the good thing about it is it's right there at your finger if you wanted to look it up or call Carol and, and but I can tell you right now liquor and food absolutely not yeah but to answer your question what you would need for a successful grant the Humanities Council grant will make it happen they will make it happen it has to be a specific yeah. Yeah. subject matter and a specific sort of time frame, right? Yes. It can't be ongoing. No. no. Mm -hmm. you Cannot. Go ongoing by going different you decades. start the grant, you say when your grant is going to start, you say when your grant is going to end, and one of the things, um, I think I got sidetracked, excuse me, since we are using public money, you have to open it up to the public there has to be a public program. And that public program then is open to the public. And it's always nice to invite everybody who's been interviewed. You have to invite everybody on the Humanities Council Board. You have to invite your local officials, you know, out of good courtesy. Um, sometimes you have a very successful public program. Valina C. Jones, 70, 80 people. It was amazing. Sometimes you have five or six show up, but you've had the public program. And where do you get money for that? All of you all have connections, I know. I would ask bakeries to donate. I would ask, you know, beverage companies to donate. I would ask, you can serve wine, you just can't buy it with their money. So ask, you know, local package store or something. Uh, perhaps you can get everything donated, whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. But there has to be a public program. Tina, with the oral history from um, the Humanities Council, is there, is there a match? Yes, okay. there is a match. So get a good grant writer. If you're going to go for this, get someone who understands that. Be something as simple as Let's just say this gentleman is going to be applying for a grant. He works. He breaks down, do, 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 kind of, sort of, how much he makes an hour. 
he's going to be putting 40 hours into the grant, 40 times his salary. That's in-kind service. If your organization or the church puts in the use of a hall, the meeting yeah. hall, how much would you charge at Ground Zero yeah. if I came in and wanted to rent it for a birthday party? That's exactly what we did. That's in-kind. Mm -hmm. uh, some grants require dollar match, some money. So it doesn't have to be a lot usually, but it depends upon the grant. So, and again, if you are unfamiliar with this, there is a good resource, Carol at the Humanities Council, Kevin Green, I would be happy to help you. But the grant is, it's just follow the directions and do what the directions say and you're golden. It's as simple as that. Any other questions on that? Sure. Yes, ma'am. Now we go back to the public. Um, what, what'd you call it? Public, public, public program. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you are saying there. It's whatever you want it to be, but you have to let people in your community know what this grant was about oh. and what you did. Okay, so we're not, we're not talking a physical, uh, like today is a program type of thing. It could be this. But it doesn't have to be. No. So it can be going to somebody, all these different people's houses. You could host it at your house if you wanted. Okay. And invite the people whom you interviewed. Or you go to their houses. Uh -huh. My point is, you don't have to say, you don't have to have a program where the interviewees come and are, interv are, are interviewed there. That's not necessary. You can simulate an interview, which Valina C. Jones did, and it was an absolute hit. So the interview had already taken place. The public program was at the Bay St. Louis Little Theater. Uh, keep in mind, public and one of the teachers who had taught at Valina C. Jones went on the stage and sat down, and the interviewer went on the stage and sat down, and they reenacted for a little bit their interview, and it was marvelous. You could have heard a pin drop. Everybody was just on every word. Aww. Yeah. So that was very successful public program. There was a few cookies and some water, and it was great. Yes. Are you saying that you share your findings? Yes. Yep. That's what the public program does. That's a good way of saying it. Public history. Yes. Yes. Does the public program involved, does it have to be in person or would it qualify like posting on a website like YouTube or something? Your findings. As long as you would have an open forum, you possibly could do that. I'm not going to say yes right now, but you possibly could do that. I have never seen that, but that doesn't mean in circumstances that would be unusual perhaps um, maybe but normally they are person to person yes I was just wondering because i would seen some done locally that were posted on YouTube but I don't know YouTube won't I can tell you YouTube won't suffice no no that I know yeah yeah right. yes ma'am yes okay so the organization they do the interview and they they maintain, well, they have a copy of it, and then Mississippi, Southern Miss has a copy of it, right? Can they then share theirs with another entity? Felina's going to give it to this library. Okay. If you're with the Hancock County Historical Society, you could have a copy wherever you all have a repository. There can be right. any we number. Have, we could have copies of everybody. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's, it's your property, but USM safeguards it, and it is good that there is one repository, and I'm not saying it necessarily had to be USM, but it's off of the coast for hurricane problems, mm -hmm. and it is one repository, and it is kept, and that's where they are, and they've been there since the 1970s, and it's worked. So that's... That is a good thing. Yes. There's only one location for the repository? I'm sorry, what? There's only one location for the repository? Yes, USM has the Center for the Study of Oral History and Cultural Heritage. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean other universities are not doing oral histories, but that is where the center is that holds all of the interviews that have run through the Mississippi Humanities Council. Yeah. yeah, and there's thousands. Yeah. Did that answer your question, ma'am? Sort of. Yeah. It's all about the backing things up. So I was, when you said one. It's all backed up. Okay, that's what I Of said. course. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. I all backed up. Yes, ma'am. And then yeah, once it's stored there, how does someone, if they want to read it, they want to see it, is it only online? No. You can walk in and get the actual hard transcript. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it all digitized now? It's getting digitized. How about the ones here, the BCJ, are they going to be digitized? I, I don't know. I would, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that. Our, um, I'm not for sure. So we've been here about an hour and a half. Do we need to take a break? How about 10 minutes stretch and we'll come back? Yeah, 10 minutes stretch and we'll come back. All righty. So if we continue down our line, and please feel free to get up and get some drinks. The library has provided lemonade and sneaky snacks and all kinds of wonderful things and the space, so we're happy. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. But we're still on page three. <laughs> but this has been fantastic. Thank you all for all the good ideas and the sharing. I loved the networking on the break because you have found perhaps umbrellas and you found partners and it's perfect. So we understand then a little bit, and this is not a complete list for our interviewees, but it gets us started with the list. And then what about to the public? Now, this comes right around to the questions that we had about the public program. If you work with the Humanities Council, you have to have a public program. That's part of what you agree to do before they send you the money back, okay? But I'm not for sure about other grants, but I think that if you are working on an oral history grant and you are including people in your community, this is the community in which you live and operate, then there are responsibilities to those people. And again, this is not all of them, but this is three that gets us started. That professional standards that we've talked about, this is one of those things that we do, and it's such a privilege to get to do this for somebody to agree to do something like that, that there are professional standards. Now, the professional standards can also move into questions. We sort of got on that topic before the break. When you think about your particular subject matter that you want to do an oral history on, let's talk about the questioning process. So we've let our interviewee slash narrator know We've set up an appointment with that person. We've given them all the details about the project. You can explain to them, uh, you know, we've, we've been funded by this entity or that entity. This is what's going to happen with the interview. You give all the information. That doesn't mean you won't be asked again when you get to the interview, and that's okay. As long as we are open and communicating 100%. Now, questions. I think in circumstances of community oral history projects, general open-ended questions that you can send ahead of time, not to walk in the day of the interview and say, you know, oh, here are your questions, ma'am. Are you ready? Are you ready? No. Send those questions ahead of time. Get on my it, tractor, would you? <laughs> yes. You know, it might have to be, if, if, they're, if they're good with email, send them by email. If you like a letter, send them in a letter. If you drop them off at the house. That way they can begin thinking. Now, caveat. Sometimes people are wanting to do the interview. They have the questions in front of them and they will write the answers out. 
And when you go in for the interview, <laughs> they're reading it. And it's just sterile. Mm -hmm. It's just sterile. So you need to, if you're going to come up with, I would come up with three, four, five general questions that these are the topics that we're going to be talking about. This is things that we can bring up, but I would not be specific and make them very open-ended. Because I've said two or three times, as the interviewer, you are going to be exhausted, and this is why. When you go in for the interview, you are going to be sitting, literally, in many instances, here to here, across from a dinner table, or maybe next to someone, or across the living room, wherever the person is comfortable. You're going to be looking that person in the eye. You're going to be listening with everything you've got because you want to make sure that you are directing the interview to what the purpose is. But what if I'm over here and I'm interviewing you and you and I, we're connecting, we're interviewing, and I want to know about what he does for a living. Maybe he works for something and I'm, you know, the company, I'm interviewing about the company. But he makes this little statement that when I was a child and moved here from, um, where do you want to come from? Um, Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, how in the world? Because I'm talking to him and I'm listening to him, but I'm thinking, how did he get from Hawaii to Bay St. Louis? What's that trip? So I finish up my conversation, I've tucked it away, and I go, well, let's go back to when you were a child and you came from Hawaii. Do you remember? Can you tell us a little bit about that? That wasn't even anywhere near a question that we had sent to him. But it's what I like to call, it's one of those fantastic rabbit holes you get to go down with someone. And it's such a personal thing. It's just such a connection with another person that you get to do that. Now, you can't go down the rabbit holes for the whole interview, but when you come across a little gem that is so very interesting that it merits per, you know, pursuit, go ahead and pursue it and get it in on the record. And that way, you've got it. And when you are sitting there listening to someone so intently and you're sitting and you're interviewing and you're trying to, it really will, I'm telling you, you will be physically exhausted and mentally tired in doing it. Again, how many interviews per grant depends, but let's say eight to 12. That's comfortable. How long per interview, hour, a video, a whole nother game. If you want to video, um, we were talking on the break about the video. This is not a grant for a video. This is a grant for a, uh, oral history. If the person is comfortable with it, um, you know, it, it depends. Your videographer, sometimes the videographer will bring in, I know I've seen them, you know, the big, um, the big lights, the big umbrella lights set the big umbrella light and put the tripod and, <laughs> and by that time the person is <laughs> I'm not doing it. You know? it, it it's so much easier to listen to yourself than to go back and look at yourself and people with videos oftentimes just simply don't want to be videoed so it depends it depends on the video but if you want video just make sure you've got your recorder in front of you and you're getting the oral history for the grant. And it's, you got it, yes. Another thing is, you know, if you're exhausted, but leave your recorder on because sometimes people will come up with, oh, I forgot to tell you right. something. They're just sort of warmed up, right? Right. They, they'll add one little gem and you're like, where is it? You know? Yeah, and sometimes you'll go in and they'll yeah. say, I don't really know anything about it, but, da -da 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 -da. and you haven't even turned the recorder on, and you want to say, wait, wait, let me click the button. 
but you've missed that. So it's as the interviewer, you are charged with a lot. You have to control the tone of the interview. You have to keep the interview on track. You have to make sure you catch everything with the interview. You have to look at your clock and you can tell the person, you know, we've been talking for about 45 minutes, how do you feel? And if they say, well, I've just, you know, then you say, well, okay, and you can end it. Now, when you begin the interview, one of the things that I suggest is that you go in and you sit down, you talk to the person a few minutes, you get the gift statement. You get the gift statement before the recorder goes on. And then you start the interview. You are collecting history. Always get a little bit of biographical information about the person. Can we have your full name? Where and when were you born? Parents' names children's names, parents' names are always important for genealogists. Uh, where, you know, if, if, if this is about school, well, where did you go to school? Have you lived here all your life? Give yourself about five, six minutes at the beginning to talk about the person. And that way, the uh, sometimes, not only are you recording for genealogists and for history, but the person relaxes. You don't jump into the interview and let them talk about this and give it time. And it really makes for a rich interview because you know who you're talking to now. You know, if that little farmer that I'm on the back of the tractor has always lived in the country, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. So just always get that. and. Always give the date and the place you are at at the beginning. So, you know, I am Deanne Stevens. It is May the 6th in Bay St. Louis Library. I am interviewing Cheryl Thompson. And Miss Thompson, tell us a little bit about yourself and we go on. Yes. Does the biographical info become public record? Yep. Too? It is. If they want, don't want to, you just say thank you. You don't have to have it. Now, if you look to the back of the very back pages of the booklet, this is a good point to bring up. The very back pages of the booklet. This is another document that USM likes to have. Likes to have. And this gives information about the person who is being interviewed. Um, it's pretty detailed. And if someone says, I'm not comfortable doing this, well, they're not comfortable doing it. Mother's name, name, birthday, yeah, like not comfortable. Um, and then, of course, this is stuff that helps with the rounding out of the oral history but it is a different world. So if they're not comfortable doing it and they say, no, I don't really want to give you that information, then you just say, well, thank you and move on. Don't worry about it. But to your point, most people give it. I've never had anybody not give it. So whether that becomes um, fuel for nefarious operations, I don't know. I don't know. Yes. Are you putting this document in the binding and on the website, or is this, this for is, metadata and for any It's for files? metadata and stays at USM. Yep. Yep. If you listen to public radio NPR, I think it is at 12 noon, there is a um, Mississippi moment, yeah. and that is pulled from the oral history collections. That, and they're just little snippets, and you get to hear the person talk, and that's pulled. But again, nowhere on there does it say we're talking to a 67-year-old man who lives at da, da 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 You know, it's just snippets. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, ma'am. Well, to her point, uh, when I recently wrote my husband's obituary, 
I didn't, I specifically did not include all of these details about mother's maiden name and all of that. It was very generic on the guidance of the funeral home. Yeah, yeah. It's good points to consider. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, for the gift statement, if, if the interview, if it was and it's in two parts, let's say they say, I'm tired, can you come back tomorrow and complete it? Do we have to do a second gift statement? No. Oh, okay. No. And that would be a case where you have the time to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. But no, not a second gift statement. Oh, it covers the one interview. Okay. Right. So if we look, questions. Okay, if we look at number two, interviewees should be selected based on their relevance to their experience of the subjects at hand. We all know wonderfully great people who have done wonderful great things. But if they didn't go to that school, they don't need to be interviewed. You don't have time or money to interview just to interview. Make that a different interview. Make that a different grant altogether. So when you sit down and brainstorm with your colleagues about your uh, project, you just make sure, um, I can tell you, and I keep referencing Valina because it was the most recent one and it was so successful. Um, you, we sat at a table, and any time you want to chime in, but we sat at a table and, well, I know this person and this person who went to the school, plus, you know, most of them had gone to the school who were being and interviewing. Well, uh, this teacher lives down the road. She taught there. So it was round table. Was everybody interviewed? No. No. It just worked out, and it was a sharing of names. Then the names were divided up. Well, I know her. Well, yeah, I know him. He lives down the road. So it was logical who was to contact whom. It's not always going to work out that way, but that's the way it worked out for this grant. The contacts were made. How was the um, recorder going to be shared? That was worked out because there was only two recorders, and there were six or seven interviewers, maybe a few more here and there. So that was worked out, and then the interviews were done. And where were the interviews housed? There was one repository where they came back to and were downloaded from the recorder. And then when they were all finished, there's the completed grant. But look at all of the steps of putting it together and making sure that it happened. And then oftentimes at the meetings, sometimes at the meetings, there where not just you as the interviewer talking to the interviewee slash narrator, but there was actually a letter composed, hard mailed out, and given to the people who were potential interviewees. So they received a letter in the mail about what was going on. Then they received contact, person to person contact, then they received contact again as to when they could be interviewed. Then they were interviewed. So sometimes some of the folks who were interviewed had three or four points of contact before they actually began the interview. So again, that might not work for your grant, but I think that it made people comfortable. I think it made people comfortable to do that. So however you wish to work out the grant, Again, when you and your colleagues get together, that's the best way to do it, okay? Questions on that? Okay, then number three, uh, the interviewer should provide complete documentation. That is anything that they need to know. I actually had someone one time ask me, well, well what are you doing? I, I wanna see a copy of the grant. Here it is. It's not secret, top secret stuff, here it is. That would be fine, that would be fine, okay? So again, these standards to guide histories, and this is the last of the page four, you want your group to legally protect itself, that would be the gift statement. You want your group to keep accurate records who is being interviewed by whom, 
You would never want two people to show up on two different days. It has to be meticulous record keeping. And then all conversations with the interviewees, as much as it takes. If it takes two or three and you've got the time and it's pivotal to talk to that person, give the person the conversation. Let the person know what you're wanting to do and why you're doing it. Well, I don't know. Let me talk to my daughter and see and call me back. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. So work with your interviewees, okay? Questions, comments? Okay, yes ma'am. I'm sorry, um, an entity can only have one grant going at a time, isn't that correct? Correct, with the Humanities Council. That's, that's you can apply to another organization and, yeah. Okay. Yep. The next few pages, Page five, if we haven't answered all of the questions in our conversations, I thought that you all would appreciate having from the, again, Oral History Association. This is the Professional History Association, but it's all humanities and all people who do oral history. But again, you know, this idea of, um, we were speaking on the, um, the break about what is oral history and how do we do oral history? This just, I, I thought you would appreciate just having it su succeed for you. You can read this at your own pleasure. And then the guiding principles, you know, like number six on page six, the interview process must be transparent. Well, we, we've talked about that. So this just has all that you would need to know. Uh, page seven, preparation and communication. This is basically what we have been discussing, how you would go by. Uh, again, I'll use the, um, the analogy, it's like painting a house. It's gonna take you twice as long to get ready for the grant and to do the interviews than it's going to be to do the interviews. Um, the oral history interview, that begins on page seven and it goes through uh, and then page nine, this is something we haven't talked about with using oral history sources. This is one thing I wanted to tell you. What your imagination can think of is what you can do. Let me tell you an unbelievable oral history story. And it was the original oral history um, that uh, was in 2000 and it was for Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. I mentioned that to you. Well, there was an art teacher who got in touch with me and said, this intrigues me. How can we collaborate with these oral histories in art? I'm, you know, we started talking and I mean, we talked for two hours. So what did that result in? Western Michigan University and having a group of teachers listen to oral histories about South Mississippi. Then they had to create a piece of art wow. from what they heard. That's awesome. Then, oh, it gets better. Oh, wow. <laughs> awesome, right? Theater. The theater department put together, now obviously my art friend graduated from Michigan, but my, the theater department put together an exhibition and it was an interactive exhibition that they did in the theater based upon the oral histories. Oh, yeah. And at that time, this was several years ago, um, the, the themes that came through were so clear and they were so well done that this was an absolute hit. Then, sir, we did go to Hawaii with it. <laughs> we took it all the way out to Hawaii oh with a, gosh. but it was all, not history, we don't have that kind of money. It was all through the Arts Council that we went out there That's with awesome. it. Then you get to go to Mac. Yes, <laughs> then you get to go. So if you are going to think about what you're going to do with oral history, the, the sky and the pie, whatever you want to do with it, 
it doesn't have to just be transcript and put it on the on the shelf. You can work with teachers about it. You can, if you think about doing grants, I hate to say it, but if you involve children in some way, there is so much money available. This could be something that you could go into schools with. You could talk about things. You can do whatever it is you want to do. If you want to bring math in, how far did you have to travel to do the oral history? How far is Hawaii from Mississippi? What would you do? Think about as a classroom teacher what you could do with this with your help and your organization's help. So what can you do with oral histories? Whatever you want to do. You can write a book or an article from them. I use oral histories in every book and article I've ever written. They're vital to my research. So anything you want to do, you can do it. So using oral history, whatever you want, okay? And it goes on to page 10. And then... Um, Dina, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, on page 8, it talks about the interview should not be made public until the narrator as the original recording copyright holder. That's your gift statement. Okay. That's the so gift statement. The copyright just kind of Yeah. Got okay. Some people call it, but that is our gift statement. Okay. And it goes back to the gentleman um, asking, should the person who's being interviewed, the interviewee uh -huh. slash narrator, if you want to let them listen to the oral history, that is your grant. That's fine. If you want to explain to them that there is going to be a transcription ultimately coming, that is fine. Time and money, what do you have? And personnel in some instances. So however you want, just as long as the communication is clear that the person knows, I'm going to have to wait a little while to see my transcript, but when I do see it, I can correct it. As long as that is clear. And if they want to hear the interview, and if you play the interview back to them, this question came up and they don't like it, it's gone. It's just gone. It's not a problem. Yes, ma'am. Do you fact check anything like dates? No. When I write books, I do. But when they remember and say, oh, I think it might have been 1943, no, maybe 1945, let it go. Just let it go. And that's another thing. Oral history, you cannot base a complete sound fact on it because our minds all play tricks. So what do you do then if you want to fact check? Go look up textbooks, go look up newspapers, go fact check. And you still can use the oral history in research. You just make the statement. And then you give the correct date. It's 1946. That's not a problem. You give that to if you wanted to make a publication from that is what I'm saying. Yeah. But otherwise, ma'am, you just let that oral history go. You just let it go. It is not your responsibility to go back and correct grammar and correct facts and correct anything. You just listen to the oral history. Their story. Yeah. Their story is their story. That's right. And you, as the interviewer, you are so small of a part in that interview. You don't need to say, well, you know, I, I, I know what you're saying. When I went to that carnival, I did this, this, this. Nobody, no, 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 no. You are the interviewer. You guide that person along, and your words should be minimal at most, absolute minimal. It's the person who's being interviewed that should take up the majority. Yes, sir? When the transcripts get sent back to, to, the, um, to the individual, are, are we notified that that process is going on? No. Your grant is over. That then becomes between them and them. So when it's no finished, because honestly, sir, sometimes that takes a while. Sometimes well, that takes. If for some reason, he just procrastinates. And they do. You know, if I knew about it, maybe I could encourage him to go ahead. And, Not uh, a good idea. No. 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 Once you have done your job, 
you've done your job. Yeah, you've done your job. All our videos are copyright. Yeah. What now? Go ahead. Suppose the interviewee passes away before then, it. Then you will find out through USM and they will contact you and they will work through a family. Okay. And folks, that has happened. And the family simply says, no, we're not pursuing it. And that interview then is lost. It becomes then the family. Yes. Yes, sir. Do we do the transcripts or do we allow them? USM does them if you do a humanities grant. Okay. But if you do a different kind of a grant and you have a copy of the interview, then as mentioned here, there's uh, all kinds of things on computers. You might have money to buy, hire somebody. Your company might hire a transcriber. You know, the transcriber I had was out in Arizona. And it just worked out beautifully. I sent them and she did it and she sent it back and there it was. So it depends on what you want to do with the grant. Yes? Can you uh, interview telephonically and record it with a... So, so bad. Okay. So, so bad. And it comes up every grant I've been associated with, well, so-and-so lives so-and-so place. Can we talk by phone? Oh, no. You don't catch the nuances. You don't have that personal connection. Oftentimes, it doesn't record well in many instances. And I know I've got an iPhone myself. We've got all kinds of newfangled phones. It's, it's better not to. Just same way with Zoom. Same way with Zoom, or I use Teams a lot, WebEx. It just whatever platform you want. It just doesn't work out always. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. OK, so we do the interview, and it goes up to USM, um, waiting for it to be transcribed and approved. <laughs> what can we do with it? Can we put that on our website? Not our website, but into <laughs> our history at all? Until. Remember I told you, you're not going to be told when it goes out to, but you will be told when it comes back and it's been double checked by the interviewee. At it's point. at that point that it, it becomes public. Okay? Questions? Okay, on page 11, um, there is just more information about what you should do and how to do it. Again, you can look it over. And then on page 12, it continues. Uh, you know, during the interview, Lord, shoo, girl. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how to tell you this, but you got to think about it as the interviewer. It's got to be quiet. The recorders are so delicate; they'll even pick up, you know, pick up breathing. If the lawn's being mowed outside, if the children are coming in and out. If someone else is sitting there and wants to contribute to the interview, it, it doesn't work out. The environment of the interview has got to be you and the person and a quiet place, if at all possible. Uh, when I did some interviews here at this library, we went into, what's that little room, Ms. Parker? There's a little room over here. And we were able to go in there and we closed the door and it was perfect. You didn't hear anything, you didn't see anybody. And it was absolutely perfect for that. If you don't have that, try to tell the person, you know, is there going to be any yard work? Um, sometimes they don't know there's going to be yard work. And you're talking to them, and here comes the weed eater. You know, the yard person is there. Or, a train could go or the train goes yeah. by. Yeah. And if that happens, yeah. click off and just say, let's just wait for the train to go, or let's wait, and sometimes someone will go out and ask the weed eater or the grass mower, you know, can you go to the other side? You can work it. You, you are the interviewer, just work it. But you need a quiet place, okay? Um, 12 continues, let's see, 13 continues. This was some of the questions that you all had the intended number eight and nine, the intended use and altering or withdrawing your oral history interview. Folks, your interviewee has the absolute right to pull it at any time he or she wants to pull it. Even after it has gone through the process of transcribing, they have taken out what they don't want, it has become public, they can say, I've been thinking about it, I don't want it, I don't want it ever. It gets shredded and gone. 
So that is a right that they have. You know, this isn't, that's why you as the interviewer must be very carefully, or very careful in you laying out exactly what is going to happen with this interview. What is going to happen? And then number 10, the formal agreement. That would be for USM, the gift of statement. And then there is about copyright. The legal release is the gift of statement. But this just explains it a little more for you. The last thing that I have in my booklet, and then we want the library to share some stuff with us. Um, I thought that I would share an oral history interview with one of the most famous collections of oral history interviews. So we already said that oral histories began in the 1940s, okay? Now, this particular oral history interview, this is multiple volumes, and if you have a Sunday afternoon and want some interesting uh, reading, I suggest you go back and look at all of these. But the Federal Writers Project during World War II, the WPA, uh, during the Depression, excuse me, in looking for employment opportunities, collected oral histories. Who knew? Our own Eudora Welty took pictures for the WPA. You know, I mean, it was marvelous collections. So there is a little bit about it. Now, if you want to put a page like this explaining what, you can if you have it, but that's up to you. Then I put, included just the names of all of the people who would be in here. And then there's this little page that gives the information about the interview I included. And then you turn the page and there's the interview. Now, what was the purpose of these interviews? To interview people who had been enslaved. That was the whole purpose. Every person who was interviewed in this project had once been enslaved. So you get their words and their conversation and their perspective. Now, ma'am, that goes back to the question about fact checking. Mm -hmm. Who's interviewing these people? Younger white people. Mm -hmm. Deferential, racism, all of that comes into play. So you already take it with a grain of salt. But what you can learn in these yeah. interviews, I went through them one time and looked for med medical things. What did they use for medicines? What did people use for medicines? What you can learn is phenomenal. But this is the way a transcription in the 40s, when they finally got around to do them, looked like. So here, and I can tell you, historians have relied upon those WPA slave narratives, as they're collectively referred to as, for years in their research. This became history, and this was nothing but to employ people. That's what this whole thing was about. So I thought it would be interesting for you to see that. They call it Memories Of, and he goes through, you know, talks about what he did, where he lived, what went on. Uh, there's a little note, you don't do that, the transcription person does. And um, that would be an example of an oral history. Now, they're not all going to look like this, but they're all going to carry this kind of importance and this kind of historical significance. Absolutely. So, questions or comments about anything? All right, the library has something. I'm going to ask Ms. Parker to come up and show you because this is super cool too. What they're what they're going to help with and provide. First, if you haven't signed in, sign in so we can be in touch with you. We we have some ulterior motives. I'll be sending you a survey to get some feedback. And if you are working on a project, we have some resources and would love to partner with you. Um, so just to give you some feedback on why we're here today, last year we joined the Internet Archives Community Webs program which is uh, archiving of websites and web content. And out of that, we got a grant. And we used that money to focus on our, um, our goals and initiatives in local history to purchase some oral history kits. These will be something that we can check out and for the next to partners like you for doing projects. Um, we also 
in addition to buying these kits, which come with, we have a form that you can gift us your collection so we can help um, pres preserve those collections of history. Um, we've got a recorder, we've got two microphones, and we have a resource book in here to help you plan, help you write your questions, all of that. Um, we also, as part of that grant, got some um, storage space on the Internet Ar Archives vaults, which is a digital preservation system. So we will be curating um, oral histories, photographs, and other digital collections for the purpose of collecting Hancock County's local history and then sharing it with the, the public. So that is something that have a project, but maybe you need the recording equipment or you need space to do it at one of our libraries or you bring back the files to us and um, of course lots of resources to do transcription and, and all of that, but we have space for it and we will be able to share that with the public. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pack. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna have time to play with these today, but well, we're, you can we that's our last part, things. yeah. Um these have never been used, so mm. they're here together, they've been cataloged so we can check them out, but we've got the Zoom H6 recorder with the um, accessories. We've got uh, an oral history manual. And then we have two microphones with a stand and for an external microphone to connect one for each of you i suppose mm -hmm. yeah. can i make a comment about microphones yeah. i wouldn't no. so i'm going to walk up here and i'm i think they would be good for some situations but you're talking to someone and you set that down and you sit back and you forget it you just forget it. Yeah, if you use a microphone, now sometimes you might, but if you use a microphone, you're going to pick up every noise on it. Every noise on it. Even if you have a microphone like I'm wearing right now, and I feel sorry for who's ever listening to it because I'm loud, but even if you have a microphone like this, I've actually heard hair. <laughs> You know, it picks their soul. It picks up everything. So a microphone in some instances, but these are fantastic. Fantastic. But you know, if, you're, if you've got that outside noise, let's say sometimes a directional mic could help, you know, kind of depending on read, the situation. Read the room. Yeah, sometimes something yeah. could really Read help. your room. Yeah. This is fantastic. So you don't even have to get a grant right now. <laughs> you can play and have fun. And we also have an agreement if you are donating to, yeah. to us that has some resources that basically says copyright information that you're donating it to us, the, the person would sign it. We have um, some descriptive information that we would collect so that we can put our, the metadata in so that it can be searchable, findable, we can categorize it and put it in collections and some biographical information for as well as an interview log, if you if you decide to do that and go through it and say, well, at this point in time, they talked about this specific thing as part of the project, and then that's something that we can be sure that when we get the, the recording, we can get that metadata in so that it's findable. So nice. Last question. Is it a must that we donate um, interview to, to Hancock County Library okay. System? We're not going to require that. You can check these out and use them. Okay. For right now, we're trying to encourage that because we would love to get those collections started. Um, but this is for community use for, for any projects that anybody is doing in the community. Very, very nice. The library also has a foundation, which is a 50C, 501C3. And they have a mission and a vision. And if your oral history project is in alignment with um, their mission and vision, system, mm -hmm. your, your recordings and the transcripts, and we have it as part of our collection, so future people can utilize it from within our system. Wow. Um, but that's okay. also a, a resource and an option as well when thinking about oral history projects within Hancock County. Okay. Uh, the, the, the foundation. Yeah, 
That's fantastic, fantastic. The, the last part, thank you so very much. Um, what a wonderful resource, yes, wonderful resource. <laughs> we also, all of that information, at least the web archiving, our web archiving part is on our website. So um, if you're interested, we are soliciting, if you know of a website or you're part of a, a group that has a website, um, you can submit the URL to us so that we can make sure that it gets okay. preserved. Fantastic. And of course you need a library card to check out the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs>